Okay. So, a short intro. We have uh, Errol Fox here. She is with um, Ushahidi, and she will talk about a project they are currently doing in Nairobi. And as we are already a little bit out of time, you are not. We, you have time enough. I think that's fine. Yeah, we'll try and stick to time. Uh, so yeah, we had font problems. Uh, apologies. Um, so I'm going to talk about designing for crisis. So uh, about working in emergency services and international disaster relief. Uh, I, I'm Errol. Uh, I'm a designer, so I do uh, design research, UX, and visual design at Ushihidi. Uh, I've been in this industry for about 10 years doing design related things. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs, so if you reference me in any kind of tweets, please use my correct pronouns. Um, and I also have history with community development, so as I was training to be a designer, a uh, technician, um, I was doing community development work in my spare time. So that becomes important when I, when I start getting into the, the project that we were doing. So um, some of the stuff... Hmm... <laughs> Let's. What 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 should I have opened this in to? Yeah, I've got two. Uh, uh, this is not what's on there. <laughs> it's this one, right? Is it? No, that. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, that's the PowerPoint. That'll be that one. Yeah, this. But um, do, doing this kind of um, ah, okay, there, there we go. <laughs> well, again, we'll get through it. We'll get through it. I'll use arrow keys. It'll be um like a very slow process. Um. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this is the kind of community work that I used to do, things like homework clubs with kids, green mapping, I uh, volunteer for Team Rubicon, which is an international disaster relief volunteer organization, and we do lots of different, different things over the years with the community, so I'm very, very community-led in my approach. So if you don't know about Ushihidi and what Ushihidi does, uh, so we are a humanitarian tech company that was born in Nairobi and Kenya in the 2007-2008 uh, election violence. So the founders were seeing some of the conflict that was happening around the country and they decided to create a crowdsourced open source mapping tool for citizens to be able to report what they were seeing happen on the ground. So it was a different kind of approach that was seen before. It's very, very much like like empowering the communities to talk about the kinds of things that were they were seeing day to day. Since since its um, birth in 2007-2008, we've uh, had Ushihidi deployed all over the globe in lots of different scenarios. So the one the the example that on the screen there is when when there were the earthquakes in Nepal, it was used to map uh, all the different kinds of things that were happening there. And then they used that information to send in helicopters and to coordinate the relief effort. We also have many other tools, uh, some of which open source, some of them not, um, because they're currently in development. So we have another tool, which is a crisis communication tool called 104, which is about how to reach teams when you're in a crisis scenario. And again, this was born out of another incident in Nairobi and Kenya when there were the mall attacks. So when you get um, have terrorist attacks, we can contact our team members. So we created this uh, open source tool for you to be able to communicate with your teams when there is a crisis. So that's our background as Ushihidi. That's the kind of that's the space that we've operated in now for ten years. That very much to do with how people submit their own reports, submit their own data, how to empower them to use technology to make make themselves heard, to raise their voices, and for organisations and people to respond to that. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about this project that we've been working on. It's a new tool that Ishihidi have been working on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about crisis background, which is anybody who's in sort of crisis, international disaster, uh, you will feel very familiar, but bear with me. I'm going to talk about the minimum viable products that we created and the field research mostly that we, that we conducted in Kenya. 
And to only two challenges in learnings, so there were many, many more of which I've got a about a 30 page PDF if you're ever interested in reading a, a really fascinating document about all the different things that we discovered from, the, from this project. But I'm just gonna focus on two, two challenges and two learnings in my time that I've got. So the problem statement that we were trying to solve for with technology is this one. So in a crisis, finding out what people who are affected need is really complicated. And for those of you within this scenario, you might be familiar with some of those complications, but if you're not, the kinds of complications can be the organizations, like relief organizations, tend to have a certain set of things that they can offer. So it's a very top-down approach. We have this, we're going to offer you this, and the community might actually have that need, but they also might have more complex needs as well. So they might have needs for not just um, clean water, but also working electricity. They might have needs for connectivity. They might have needs for all, any, any number of things. And the relief effort organization can be quite dispersed and quite chaotic sometimes. Um, so what we wanted to try and figure out is how we can start to solve some of these, these, um, these complex problems uh, around crisis. And one of the things that we've... Oh, so I'm going to just talk about the the like, life cycle of a crisis really quickly. So, and where we've worked in before as Ushahidi and where we have good knowledge and then where we're hoping to make a new innovation. So you have, you have uh, sort of three different sectors of a crisis. And when I talk about a crisis, it can be a natural disaster or it could be a man-made disaster, like a terrorist attack. They typically follow a similar pattern. So you have a before phase, which is typically E there might have been a crisis m in the past in some, some way, but there's kind of like a resilience phase. So this can be a phase where you can have like quite a lot of effect, quite a lot of impact if you know that a community was in that phase. You have a response phase, so this is like a during phase, so that's when the event is happening or shortly after the event has happened. And then you've got a recovery phase, so the, the, um, the real impact of what that event has has had on that community and then time some some time elapses in some communities it's longer some communities it's shorter it depends on the development effort within the communities and how connected the governments are um, but typically they cycle back into the resilience phase at some point so what we wanted to test and we got some funding from the Rockefeller Foundation to test this uh, technological intervention. So can a tech tool help a community build capacity to help each other before, during, and after an incident? So what are the, what are the technological interventions that can be made? And we really pulled on some of the, some of the research we did in uh, Kathmandu. So I just want to bring up my notes so that I say all the different organization names accurately. So this was the, the earthquakes that happened, and they had a really, really robust response to these, these earthquakes. Uh, the mapping effort was really fantastic, and it was partly due to the, the building of partnerships within the local area. One of our project leaders at the time at Ushahidi had built a series of different partnerships with some organizations. So it was the Kathmandu Living, Living Labs, and they mapped all the health facilities in the valley uh, before the earthquake. That's really important before the earthquake. And there was an organization called the Tan Standby, Standby Task Force, and they organized the digital volunteers to deploy within a crisis scenario. They did things like searching social media for reports and like triaging those things and, and categorizing them. And they helped create like the database that, that fed into fed into these um, mapping efforts. And then you had the micro mappers, uh, so they were and again, analyzing tweets, looking for pictures and evidence of damage, and they were also looking for needs. You had Humanity, Humanity Road, and they were closing the communication gap in a sudden onset disaster. So that's when you've got multiple different organizations going in, sometimes offering similar aid. It's about closing the communication gaps between these organizations so that they're not overlapping effort and that they're meeting the needs of the community. So other examples that we researched on the, these kinds of things were uh, Hebden Bridge in the north of England also had a similar response. So before a series of floodings that happened there, they had a really robust, uh, it was a shopping street with lots of different independent stores and they had a community. They had a community Facebook page, they had community response as community organization. And they were able to organize the 
response to that flood better because they had this network of, of people that were interested in the area but also connected in some way. There's another example uh, somewhere in, in Canada called Saskatoon. There is a badminton club, an area that had a incident. They were able to respond to that better as a community because a lot of the community members were members of a badminton club. And it seems sort of um, silly to some, to, to some extent that the idea of a badminton club or a shoppers association can organize an effort in response to a crisis, but it's really, it's really the thing that we were na nailing in on on this, um, on this project and our technological response to it. So yeah, we did a lot of research locally uh, what we call ethnographic research and we embedded ourselves in various different communities this is um, we wanted to make sure that we got an understanding of all the different kinds of people that are involved in a in a crisis response so from the emergency services right down to the communities so we have this hypothesis that more connected communities are going to create better response to crisis but we wanted to make sure that we included all different points uh, of a response to a crisis so this is why we went and talked to um, different emergency services in different countries as well. And um, we all, we, we went to lots of different remote communities in places in Africa and places in the Northwest Territories of Canada, as well as countries like the UK and the Netherlands and, and Ireland. And a lot of this, personally, a lot of this work started to look really familiar to me. If you remember back at the beginning of the presentation, the community development work that I did in a previous life. So it was really familiar to me, this idea of how communities organizing certain activities, certain responses within the community can really contribute to a wider response to, to crisis. So it all started to come together. And what we, what we did, is we looked at this user ecosystem. We started to look at the ways in which we can make an impact. Then, what, what, who do we want to, who do we want to build something for? And very quickly, we removed the official emergency services from our, from our consideration, for, <laughs> for a very, very good reason that I'll go into a little bit later. And then we started to identify that we've got a few different key groups of these communities. So we've got people that are organized, but not kind of digital. So not using tech tools in which to organize their communities. And you've also got people that are not organized, but they're looking to help and they might be more digitally connected. You've got variations in between all the, these kinds of different ones, but these are some key groups that we were looking, looking at impacting. So we looked at building a, an MVP. This is the this is the process that we went through, uh, a lot of crunch, four months of research, design, dev, field, and report. So this is the process that we went through in order to build this, this technology. And what we came out with at the end of this research is a product we called Dispatcher. Okay, so Dispatcher is uh, at the moment still in MVP mode. You can still use it. It's um, on its uh, on the getdispatcher.com URL. And what we were talking about and what we wanted to try and achieve within this is build that sense of a community, being able to be connected, but also with the purpose of offering help and receiving help. So an exchange of some kind of uh, connecting method to build that sense of community that the badminton club had, that the helping helping groups had, and, and these kinds of things that we observed within the communities where they, they were already robust. So those kinds of communities in, in the crisis zones, what they were doing was, you know, uh, uh, sort of snow, snow drift would happen, and because you play badminton with person down the road, you know they've got a four by four and you know they can drive you to your job because they have access to the resources that you need when you're in a community. And they were doing that naturally. So those communities were doing that within the, their informal settings. And what we wanted to do was build a tool that also encouraged that in other places. So we built this tool dis dispatcher and we call it peer-to-peer -peer community led needs assessment matching and recommendation system. And one of the key things about the, the system was that it had a matching element to it. So you would add your skills, you would add your resources, you would add different information about yourself and it would match you with somebody that can help or that you could help and build that sense of community. So. 
where the arrow keys. Okay, so we did a, a pilot in Nairobi in Kenya. And I just want to briefly kind of talk about why, why we chose Nairobi in Kenya, uh, other than it being a Shahidi's kind of home as such. So one of, the, one of the key things about Nairobi is that you have access to places like informal settlements, uh, such as Kibera and Kiole. And in areas like that, crowding can often lead to things like fires. So there's actually quite a high prevalence of crises, either small to large, happening quite regularly. So we were able to go into a place where we could observe community crises happening uh, very, very like frequently, so that we could really relate what we were doing to directly to, to what people were experiencing. And it also, Nairobi gave us like this access to people with a breadth of different incident experiences. So you've got people, people that have experienced things on a larger scale, like things to do with election violence, things to do with crime rates, things to do with some of the recent flooding, uh, and also the terrorist attacks. But then you've also got these uh, smaller scale crises happening in the communities around uh, things to do with like gender-based violence. And there were a lot of people that were ready and willing to help and looking for, for a solution to these problems. And it's also incredibly important for solving, to solve problems uh, towards Oshihidi's home base as well. So what do we do? So within the research pilot, within, within this process of, of um, testing the MVP, we did several different activities. We did a evaluative session, so where Essentially, what they are is a set of user tests where you, you put your MVP product in front of people. You ask them a series of questions to really test whether or not you've built the correct thing. We did a foundational, which were what we call semi-structured interview sessions, where we spent about two hours with various different community leaders around the area. So we sit, sat down with these different community leaders. So they could be anything from the president of a student volunteer association to somebody working within government to, to somebody that leads a housing complex, WhatsApp group, things like that. So people that were key, key figures within their local communities and actively doing things that we wanted to happen within the, within the product, within the tech tool. So offering help and receiving help and also coordinating that effort. So they were the really important people to be asking, are we creating the right thing? What are we not creating that you need to be able to facilitate this kind of work? And we came up with some really, really fascinating questions as well. So things like, how do you keep safe when you are looking to help other people in a community? How do you choose who to help and who not to help? How do you protect yourself when you're online? How do you reconcile the uh, community or the different socioeconomic uh, considerations when you want to help somebody else? Like, how do you make the decision that you should help somebody in, in this area versus this area? And a lot of really interesting interesting insight, again, in the report, which I'm happy to share with anyone at the end of this, uh, came out at the end of that. So if you're looking for these kind of pieces of information to inform the kinds of stuff that you're doing, a lot of this research is really uh, potentially useful uh, insights into those, those kinds of communities. And we also did um, explorative and promotional. Pro promotional is the slightly less exciting one where we went and we you know handed out leaflets and we we talked about the product we it was also trying to stress test it as well so trying to get as many people on boarded as well uh, to be using it in different settings and to see how it gets used and the explorative is was a was a structured stress test so what we did was we got lots of people in uh, one area for a day and we asked them to use the the product and we asked them to actually play out the different actions that you would need to do so would somebody actually go from point a to point b to give somebody a cup of sugar what are the choices that they make when they want to give somebody that cup of sugar and they have to traverse the city how do they traverse the city <laughs> so onto the onto the challenges and learnings. So the two that I've picked out, there were many. There were lots and lots, really fascinating ones. Um, but the two that I've picked out, the first one is around the discoveries that we made around official and emergency response skepticism. So 
there was skepticism both way from, from the community and the emergency services. So emergency services had questions when we presented them with this kind of tool, this kind of crowdsourced, community-led, um, trying to build resilience tool. As soon as you sort of talk to them about resilience, they were like, great, we love community resilience because that means less, less of us needing to respond to things. But they immediately asked questions like, how can we trust it? How can we control it? Um, how do, how do I learn how to use it and how long does it take for people to use? We don't have budget for this. All these kinds of things come up, which are familiar, I suppose. Um, and depending on the communities that we were researching, there were different things that came from the uh, citizens. So in places uh, like the UK, you had people saying that they don't trust the emergency services to respond to their requests because it was too small, it was too insignificant, or they didn't deem it something that the emergency service should emergency services should be involved in. And whereas in places like Kenya, you had people actively distrusting of the emergency services. So there was a lot of stories around that they're corrupt and that it's expensive, so they wouldn't be reporting and asking communities for these kinds of things, uh, asking for these kinds of things if an emergency service or an official capacity was involved in this platform. So within this um, emergency services uh, wider umbrella come, come the different aid organisations as well. So there was that understanding of, well, if an aid organisation is just going to come and respond to my request anyway, why should I bother to you know, engage with the community? So what we were really trying to do is balance that, that line in between communities helping each other and the expectation of, of aid. So yeah, and then um, this is a possibly uh, slightly controversial within the setting because we, we assumed that one of the big things that people would, would uh, find um, as their main making of a choice of whether they were going to help somebody or not was proximity. So what we thought we needed was a map with all the different resources correctly mapped to all the different areas and that people, people were going to make a real decision based on how long, how far, and where somebody else is located. Actually, what we found from the communities was way more important to them was actually a similar interest. So uh, we spent a lot of time trying to develop a, uh, an accurate directions mapping platform. And actually what we decided after the end of the research was actually what we needed to do to be able to match people that were actually going to help each other and actually build community resi resilience was a common interest. So things like new mum and baby groups. So if a, if a parent has recently had a child and they have a child within the same time period, they are much more likely to help somebody whether or not they have to travel this many miles, like lots of miles as opposed to a few miles, they're much likely to help that person because they have a similar interest. And the thing that bonded them wasn't necessarily location, but it was this mutual interest. And it goes back again to the original research of the badminton clubs, the, the community groups. And um, one of the fascinating things that we observed within this was actually people within certain communities actively turn off their location services. So they actively um, have it deactivated for most of their daily lives and then they reactivate it when they actually want a service or a something that requires location. They will turn it back on when they deem it safe to to disclose their location. There were lots of other things around location that are really fascinating about how within this context of being able to build community resilience and share resources that they wanted to not necessarily map where they were or where another person was but where a safe middle ground was as well. So the ability to be able to choose a safe middle ground and have that dialogue with another person through like a chat function was really really important more so than things like location services which I kind of realize are geo geo event is kind of like <laughs> but yeah that's um that's uh, all i have time for at the moment uh so just some information about Ushahidi. if you want to read the lengthy report of all the different discoveries that we had around safety around how communities want to communicate you're absolutely more than welcome to that um and if you're interested in seeing some of the things that people actively shared within the within the uh mvp application i can more than happy to show you those uh, through the Q&A or even move on to them. Really fascinating stuff. Things like self-defense training. 
uh, CPUs. But yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, not yet. Thank you, Errol. Um, and well done. You also kept the time, uh, although we had some technical issues. So um, I have to go to a bird of a feather session, and probably some of you as well, but I still would like to have at least one or two questions because I guess there are some questions. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, would you consider this to be somewhat of like um, a social network that you're creating? And if so, um, do you see the need for moderation to be included in this at some point? Yeah, there's a big section on the report around um, safeguarding or however you kind of want to call it, like um, safety in a sense. Uh, in, every single per in every single interview, in every single case, we talked about the issue of safety. <laughs> And um, yeah, some really fascinating anecdotes as to how people assess their own safety um, and the process of um, the personality traits of somebody that is a community member willing to give or be given to. Um, so yeah, we looked at different things like um, some of the things that we tested within the, within the um, MVP are things like reviews and things like star ratings, but then you get into tricky territory about star rating a human. <laughs> Um, yeah, and you also have misuse of that. So, you know, there's always this, there's a lot of conversations about apps like Uber, you know, the rating system is there for a specific purpose, but also, aren't you afraid to not give your driver five stars in case they don't give you five stars back? This kind of mentality played into communities as well. One of the things that we think solves this is, um, to some extent, there's still a bit of back and forth, is about allowing people to present their authentic their authentic self within the app, but not stipulate that they have to give things like your legal name, because we wanted to make sure that people that were known by a nickname could add their profile name as their nickname. But what it was, is it was about building kind of community trust. And another, another way in which we, um, in which we tried to, we tried currency as well. That kind of gave us a bad taste because we're not really into somebody saying that this person giving me a cup of sugar is worth X amount of in-app currency versus this person giving me that, anyway. So it was a lot of trial and error around how to build a very good system of how people can organize and build resilience in, but less so than social elements. P people kind of brought social into it because we had a chat function in it. So people kind of, started to build friendships, which was good because community resilience, but also, yeah, you still need a button to say, well, this person has, you know, asked me now for something outside of the request and help function, or this person has now um, done, done or said something which has made me feel unsafe, and we needed to um, have a system to moderate that. Uh, on staff moderators was, was a thing, that it can't necessarily be done by, like, an intelligence system very easily. Sorry, there's a lot in there, definitely. Uh, okay, so I have a question, uh, maybe feedback, maybe question. So you started from the example of uh, badminton clubs. Yep. They have this uh, pre-existing community, network, people who know each other, trust each other to some extent, and then are willing to help each other in a crisis, which mm -hmm. is part of their existing community which has existed and will continue to exist yep. after a crisis yep. um, and it sounds like uh, you're building a system where you connect strangers to mm -hmm. help each other uh, just once so uh, have you considered um, applying this tool to communities who already function know each other but just don't have the means to to just ask for help in that particular instance because it feels like yep. you're throwing away all of the the tissue of the community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's this is the right time to be asking these kinds of questions in M MVP mode. So, it it's always good to know that these questions are being raised. So, there are a lot there were a lot of communities that we tested with that said, "Why should we use this? We've already got a WhatsApp group that does this." 
Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah. One of the things, though, that convinced me that this is still worth pursuing was I talked to a young, uh, a young man who had a partner. He had a robust community of friends. He said that there is stigma around young men in any culture asking for help when they need help. And he said that if he asked in his WhatsApp group, uh, you know, maybe it was that he was struggling financially and needed just, like somebody to loan him some, some cash or maybe, or some, some food or something like that. This was a person from a lower income area. He talked a lot about like a very kind of, it seems like it's off topic subject, but this kind of subject about men not being able to ask for things that they need and that this system where he could go in and potentially have a system where there was a private function. He talked about wanting to be able to request something for, privately or through a pseudonym something like that, would actually enable him to start asking for the kinds of things that he needs, that he's embarrassed to ask his community, that kind of emasculated him. So I think there are still cases for it, and that there could then be a community that is grown from, from that need. So, but yeah, there are definitely already communities that are doing things in ways which are which are good and that are serviceable and they're happy with it. But there are definitely ways that you could improve that. So like the WhatsApp groups were talking about things like, you know, their process of, they would, um, they would have, a, some of them would have a three strikes rule. So if you, they, they would eject somebody from the community and it's like, well, you know, if you eject somebody from a community, you know, and then there is a crisis, is that person the first person to, to lose their life? And should there still be a place where they can build some kind of resilience um, within a community. So there's a lot of kind of ethical questions, but there's, again, quite a bit on the relevancy of this in the report. There were also, also communities that, that had systems like Facebook groups where they would actually do this kind of thing, asking, offering, but again, things would get lost in a timeline of people and there wasn't a direct matching of interest. So there wasn't people, there weren't the there wasn't the availability for people to very quickly find out, okay, this person is trustworthy, they're also somebody that has the same interests as me, and they also have this thing that I need, and I'm automatically matched without having that conversation. They could then have a conversation and reject or accept, you know, but you get that, okay, this person can help you, rather than shouting into the void <laughs> on a Facebook group. So yeah, it's um, tricky. Last question and then short one. Yeah, very short. I would say like <laughs> verification, setting priorities, and if you have a big scale crisis, mm -hmm. no internet. Yeah, no internet. Yeah, so Ushahidi, one of the original products, looks at SMS functionality. So Ushahidi's data collection platform is very, very heavily built on the idea that there are going to be, not dispatcher, no, not yet, because it's an MVP. We're testing, yeah, we're testing the hypotheses. Sometimes you have to test hypotheses to know that that, that is something. But yeah, it, it came up. It came up around, it always comes up when you're testing communities like this, the access to you know, a fully charged device, a, a device that works, um, you know, all these kinds of things come into consideration. But also it came up in, it always comes up in developed communities as well, like the UK because of literacy kind of, digital literacy levels amongst the older population in the UK, people, people can't or find it very difficult to use certain, certain tools like this. So being able to have SMS functions and things like that will be critical to these kinds of products in the future yeah so it's it's in consider it's under our consideration for the next round for sure verification Good. is still a verification came in when we talked about community leaders wanting to invite people into certain closed groups within this and then we ha again have tricky territory around who who has the ultimate power to verify that somebody is a trusted source like so is it a government? Is it a community leader? Is it? How do you quantify somebody's ability to vouch for someone? But yeah, it's worth testing, for sure. Excellent. Um, applause one more time. <laughs> and feel free to continue uh, communicating or discussing. Uh, ask a question, but I have this one.